at the very beginning, I just wanted to, for the record, have you introduce yourself, your name, your pronouns, institution, title. My name is Diane Lopez. Um, my pronouns are she, they. Um, I work for the University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, and my title is scholarly resource librarian. And I'm the, um, the subject specialist or the subject yeah, expert in architecture and planning, construction science, demography, public administration, and social work. What is your current job description um, and what duties are included in your current job? Uh, so my, my job description um, is essentially like the role of an academic librarian, of course, right? Where we provide reference services, instruction, liaison, um, with faculty and departments. Um, what the core of liaison is about is about building those relationships with faculty and with departments um, and connecting them, you know, building that relationship between the department and the library, right? And of course, you know, you do it in this more one-to-one -one approach where there is a faculty liaison for the library and then I'm the liaison for the, for the subject. And so if it's like, um, group emails or announcements or something new or just request, uh, we could approach the liaison first without having to go through the whole department. We, can, you have, we have that point of contact and that's the main aspect is that the department has a point of contact and then the library has a point of contact with the department. And so it's just for really more clear communication and, and you know, having less um, noise and just things like that. And a lot of customer service. What's a typical day on the job look like for you? That varies. And I've learned that in the two years that I've been with the institution, it varies. It's not, you know, um, it's not consistent, right? So from my experiences, I've I learned that the, the most, the busiest times is at the beginning of the semesters especially like the fall semester where it's like, um, you know, enrollment's high, there's a lot of new, you know, students. And so there's a lot of requests for instruction, a lot of requests for materials and resources for courses. Um, and so those are like the biz, the, the, like the first, I wanna say like the first two months of when the semester starts or when the quarter starts, depending on if you're in a system of semester or quarter, but those are like the busiest moments where you're, you know, you're, you're, it feels like you never step away from your desk or you're constantly walking to some other place on campus. Or in this case, when working from home is that you never leave your desk. Um, and you kind of just are just replying to emails, uh, meetings over meetings, and then, you know, it's just a lot of, uh, it's heavily more faculty interactions than student interactions because of how it's the beginning of the semester. And then within like the second, like within, yeah, the, once you're in like a regular semester of 16 weeks within like five, the fifth week, that's when you start to get the students coming in, right? Um, and especially, you know, students are, they're starting to write their papers and things like that. And so you start to get a lot more student consultations than faculty, you know, interactions. The slow time is like the summer, but that's like everybody's favorite time, I think, from my experience, because it's a time that you could just like focus. That sounds really great. And I'm actually curious, <laughs> is there anything um, over the last couple of summers or general professional development that you've been very excited about? So I've always been into programming. Um, and I picked up Python up in undergrad, but I didn't practice it like you should. <laughs> and so when the opportunity came up again to learn um, to do um, for text analysis and do and kind of learn how to set up a class for, with Python and for text analysis, like I jumped on board on that because I was just like, yes, I think um, programming, programming languages is, you know, one, I have a high interest in it, but it's also the direction I feel like a lot of institutions are going, especially with like the data sciences and the digital humanities was like keeping up with the industry um, and especially keeping up with the technology industry, I think is one of those things that I've been focusing on 
a lot in bringing into my role as a librarian is making sure that I can I'm keeping up with the tech industry and what the tech industry is doing. Um, and also that I just have, you know, a, a love for technology. And so I just like, you know, mobile communication apps, I'm always interested in that and user experience stuff. And so it's just kind of helps, you know, bring that sense into the library because students are going to be learning about these, these languages and these methods and learning new technology and using new technology. So I, I find it real crucial to always keep myself updated and never fall from that. This summer, I focused on Python and um, revamping my GIS skills. I feel supported at, at UTSA in the sense of they know that I have a high interest in technology um, and that I'm a tinkerer. Um, and so, you know, they're just like, yeah, go increase your GIS skills, go increase your data skills, because, you know, it, in the end of all of that professional development, I could turn around and help the university and the library with developing like the data services that we do. Ha we have a task team and um, and it's four of us. It's like our scholarly comms librarian um, and our STEMS librarian and our engineering librarian. And then there's me, right? Um, that just I know GIS, I know data sets, and I do I like like I play around with all that stuff. So you know, there the four of us are trying to create our data services, and we all have our unique, you know, skill sets. And so it's just it's you know taking that advantage of a place that allows you to build on your own interests is so important, right? Because it's going to be like if they tell you to do something like oh you need to learn data science but you have no interest in data science, like you're not gonna be, you're not gonna learn. You're gonna know, but you ain't gonna learn. What are your biggest goals in your current job? I attended the University of Washington, the iSchool, right? In Seattle for the MLIS program. Um, but in those two years, I did not take any librarianship courses. Um, and the reason why was I was more interested in information science research, and um, and I'm and I saw myself stronger as a researcher than you know librarianship, um, and so like one of my goals now as a librarian is to learn collection development and management and what does that mean and how does that work. Um, because I feel like since I did not take any of those classes during at UW, I was just like, okay, well, I should like learn it now. Now my goal within becoming an academic librarian is really learning like the collection development because how crucial uh, a collection is uh, for, you know, for faculty, for, you know, professors, for students, graduate students, uh, especially when they're doing research or when they're doing their assignments, is making sure that all this stuff is up to date and it's relevant and it's diverse um, and it doesn't stay stagnant. Um, and so, you know, those are kind of my goals is making sure that that the materials and resources that students do have access to is relevant to their needs and making sure that I understand each department and where their goal is. So then I make sure that the, the collection is keeping up with them and following them instead of diverting from where they are wanting to go and, and weeding out a lot of books that are no longer relevant, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm curious about what your educational and career background is and what brought you to um, libraries and digital libraries. My bachelor's, which was a beautiful seven year career, <laughs> Um, went from starting, uh, I got, I earned my associates at San Antonio College in Geography Information Systems. Um, I was interested in that because of um, voting um, data. You know, I wanted to learn and how to map out, you know, where voting polls are at, um, what populations are voting, what populations are not voting, where are most of the voting, like the promotions of like the candidates and stuff like that, where are they placing it and stuff. And 
Um, so that got me involved in GIS and um, just wanting to learn, you know, that system and that information system of how do you organize, you know, geospatial data. Um, and so um, after graduating with that degree, I continued and got my bachelor's at Texas A&M in San Antonio on the south side, um, a very small college. Um, it's at that time, it was like a two year university. So you had to go, you, you had to transfer from like a community college and then, you know, cause they only offered um, junior and senior level courses at that time, um, which was really nice because it, it, there was a lot of non-traditional students and there was a lot of older students and just kind of, um, I went there just because I was just like, I don't know if I could do like, a, I thought UTSA was big, right? I really thought UTSA was a large campus and I was just like, no, I can't do that big of a room. Like knowing that I have to share a space with like 50 other people, I was just like, nah. I, mm -mm. And so I chose that, can't, I chose to go there. And, you know, of course people were just like, oh, they're barely getting their accreditation. You know, how can you choose them? And it turned out to be a really great experience because, you know, there was a huge diversity of students um, a lot of people, it, you know, it was a lot of commuters, but a lot of like individuals who were just like, no, I, I want to earn my bachelor's. I want to get this done. And then the faculty there was so supportive and understanding of the non-traditional student. And, you know, they knew who they were working with. So they knew like, okay, like this is going to be different from a traditional university. Um, but you know, I did my soci I did sociology and political science. I took a lot of statistics courses. I got into Stata. Um, I did a lot of research um, in that, in my senior year, I did an independent study looking at um, broadband um, services and how broadband providers decide where they're going to place services at, the, the, and then learning about the digital divide and doing, um, using, you know, being in sociology and looking at like, okay, how does, you know, what's the gap in Bear County? And so, you know, the gap is between the north side of Bear County and the south side of Bear County. And like knowing that like the south side of San Antonio was a des like a technology desert uh, and learning all this information and just kind of, you know, applying it. And, um, and I think that kind of led me into wanting to know more about information and how information is shared and how information is gathered and how like technology information is used. Um, so <clears throat> my senior year, I, um, one of the, our, what, Dr. Elias, one of our faculty, one of the faculty um, had sent out a, a internship opportunity with an institution called um, the Institute, the iSchool Institution. It's I3, I always forget how the whole thing is, right? Um, but out of the University of uh, Pittsburgh, and it was really targeted directly for underrepresented students. Being in that program, um, I did a year-long research project with them over um, recently arrived immigrants or English language learners and their use of mobile technology and mobile communication apps. Um, and so, you know, that turned out to be one of the funnest projects because one, we were, we, as undergrads, we presented at the I conference in 2017 that was held at Wuhan, China, which is now my favorite secret about me, a little tidbit, I've been in Wuhan. <laughs> and, and then of course, in 2018, um, my team, um, except myself, I didn't have a chance to go to was to the I conference in 2018 that was held in Sheffield, UK. Um, where we did our follow-ups, um, where we did a, our follow-up um, study and looked at more of the user. How does the user, you know, interact, especially being an English language learner, how are they using it? What icons, what features are easy to understand? Um, you know, just kind of just seeing how one interacts with their phone and if, if it's like, um, is the mic button universal design or what you know is all these communication apps are they universal design or are they not and how do how do English language learners use it to communicate with 
um, their new city and then their home country and their family and friends. One of our PhD fellows, Brian DeSono uh, from Syracuse was like, you need to, you need to read uh, Ricardo Gomez's work. And so he tells me that he's a professor at the University of Washington and that he has focused a lot with migrants and immigrants and a lot of IT, like the information communication technologies, right? Um, with Because of that paper and the way he wrote about it and the way he wrote about um, migrants and immigrants in a very sensitive and empathetic way um, kind of made me were like, hmm, what else has he written? Um, and so then I started digging who he was, what he's done, and all his projects. And so, you know, because th at that moment, then I was like, okay, UW is like a candidate of where I want to apply to, right? Um, and I had to be smart because, of course, limited of money and stuff like that. I got, you know, I was like, okay, I don't have enough funds to pay for all those application fees and everything like that. Um, and luckily, I3 supported and helped um, a lot of us with those graduation um, fees and stuff like that. So it wouldn't be a burden on our, or a, a factor in our decision making, right? Um, and so, you know, reading all his stuff and then kind of then having the opportunity in 2017 at iConference to meet actually three of his students um, gave me that chance to kind of be like, okay, who is he? What kind of person is he? Ask those questions. All those things that you do at those um, when you visit campuses. And, you know, because I didn't do that either. I was just like, okay, you're here. I, I could just talk to you now, right? And so they they gave me, they were just like, yeah, no, he's really great. They very positive about him um, and about how he, he approached teaching and stuff like that. And so I put all my eggs in one basket and applied to UW and was like, okay, let's see if this goes. And so, yeah, I started UW in 2017 in September. I would say that was like maybe the first time I had a chance to experience what university life is like as a, like as a traditional student, because I didn't have to work. I could go full time. And I was just like, okay, this is going to be fantastic. And I was just like, okay, what do I do? And um, I was really glad that um, that Yvette Iwede, um, who was a PhD student that I met at the conference, also kept in touch with me after the conference. And Veronica, after we had that, our meeting, kept up with me. Um, there was a visiting student that Yvette and Veronica also knew. And so um, the visiting student was there to take the same class, the research methods course, right? Maria and me became really close. And so then Maria was like, oh, you should join the team for um, the CIET, right? It's the systems, system of evaluation um, for information in Saltel communities. Um, and so it was like, I was like, yeah, I, I you know, I want to learn more about um, quantitative research since I did so much quantitative I wanted to learn qualitative. And so it was like using his framework of photo historias or photo stories and using it to elicit storytelling and dialogue building. And so I was there just to kind of learn the, I, you know, the method, right? And so I asked him, I was like, hey, can I, you know, join the team and, you know, see, you know, like, what can I do, right? And so, um, you know, he had some criteria, right? Like one of the main criteria was that you had to speak Spanish and under Spanish, understand Spanish fluently. Um, and that was because, and other past experience, he was telling me that when he had students that didn't have a good ear for Spanish, um, it wasn't that you, the communication portion, right? But it was more of the listening um, that because we were already, we were working with individuals who spoke Saltel, which is an indigenous language. And so then we had translators of that indigenous language to Spanish. And so to make the process smoother, he had to eliminate the translation of Spanish to English. And um, so, you know, being a, a child of an immigrant and my mom only speaking Spanish, I, you know, I was like, oh yeah, I got that, right? Like, um, that's from birth. I, I, you know, first language and, you know, and stuff like that. 
I carried my personal statement with me all the time because it always like reminded me like, why are you here? You're here to learn about information science and how to provide information in a, in a safe and accessible way, especially for undocumented immigrants, um, recently arrived immigrants and, and, and uh, migrant workers, right? And so like that was my whole, like my, my purpose, right? So I took every class and I always applied human migration and information in every class. And so, um, and cause it essentially they gave us like four core courses that we need to take. And then the rest of it's like you choose, right? Um, and so like I took the programming, I took the metadata class, I took a lot of uh, special courses, um, the ones that like, oh, it's being taught this semester or this quarter, and it's not going to be taught again until like three years from now or something like that, or those classes that just kind of get built for that quarter and that's it. Um, but like I took like ind indigenous knowledge systems um, and a lot of different courses that dealt with underrepresentation um, because I was always like, okay, how do these courses apply to information science? And like, what, how does, how are, like these courses are available in our program for what reason, right? Like, what are they gonna show us? Um, and so that's the route I went. I went down more of the information science or the information professional researcher looking and focusing on you know, human migration and information and at all different levels of it. Um, and so, you know, there's where I think, you know, you don't help me kind of focus what I wanted to do. And like, it provided the network that I needed and the support that I needed that I never realized I could get from like a university. Uh, Cause a lot of it under, you know, when you go to community college or when you go to a small institution, sometimes you got to figure it out on your own. So yeah, like that's how I ended up at UW. That leads me to wonder, um, a lot of the things you've said there, um, I think has a lot of implications um, and kind of a lot of good advice, um, but maybe I'll ask kind of directly, um, what do you think that LIS and MSIS programs should be teaching students about digital libraries or libraries in general? And what advice do you have for the students um, interested in a career? Teaching about digital libraries is crucial because I know I didn't mention this early, but um, for one year, I worked at Bibliotech, um, the first digital library in Bear County, and I think it was, so it was like the first digital library for the nation, right? Um, and I did outreach for them. And so, you know, I, I went to uh, a majority of my time there, I spent working in high schools or K through 12, and we had a program called Bibliotech EDU, um, where we... Um, donated, um, I think, at least 10 e-readers um, to specific um, high schools within, specific, within um, the school districts, right? It was a pilot program that year. We wanted to see if this would work to promote digital literacy, right? Um, and so, of course, one of the, the, one of the caveats to it was to do presentations about digital services to K-12 students, which I was just like, oh, my God. I know how I was in high school. I was like, I am not, no one's going to listen. Right. Um, but I think was, you know, I, I think when we, when we first started, we, we first started very professional and then we realized like, why are we acting this way? We were in their seats, you know, not that long ago, we share similar backgrounds. And so then we were just like, okay, we're just going to be who we are. And, you know, and and just talk to them about it and so you know that really worked and made the presentation so much more like digestible to deal with um and and students were more active and yeah i think um yeah i think mlis programs and like lis programs um should have like a how do you interact how do uh, you know working at a digital library is different from working in a like physical library, right? Your traditional like, you know, brick and mortar ones and stuff like that. Um, because you are gonna get a different type of population, I think, because you're gonna get those, a population that um, is affected by the digital divide and they're, they're in that gap of having no access to internet, no computer at home. 
And so you have this place for them to come in and do, um, we saw so many students come in after school to do their assignments there or just to hang out there. Um, so many people were like using the computer to like apply for jobs and, you know, or sign up for um, federal assistance and things like that. So, you know, talking about that, you know, and we, you know, we mentioned diversity a lot, right? Um, in MLIS programs now. And my thought is more like, you no, know, it's like, how do we work with, you know, vulnerable communities? How do you work with oppressed communities? Um, where when someone says librarian, um, you, you imagine a different person. You think of that stereotype, right? You think of that authoritative figure. Um, and, and, you know, and that really detracts, you know, the general population from like wanting to interact with a librarian, right? And, um, and so I think one of the things that I would love to see more, and this was something that I remember um, having, you know, always kind of having this issue when I was at UW and interacting with my peers and my cohort um, was the aspect of understanding um, what is life like for someone who's vulnerable and oppressed. And so um, I had a lot of peers who couldn't empathize with that or couldn't understand it. Um, but we talked about diversity so much and but at the same time, you know, when I was a reader grader for the research method for the follow the next year, I remember a group of students had that said, oh, we're going to create a display um, for a library. And I was like, on what? And they're like, oh, on Chinese books. And I was like, Chinese books, why? And they're just like, well, the librarians there said that they have a lot of different Chinese people coming in. And I was like, okay. And they were just like, yeah, so we're going to create, we're going to make this display with all the Chinese books so they know that they're, they have those. And I was like, well, is that what they want? You know? And, and I go, did you interview the patrons or did you just interview the librarians? And then the librarians interview the patrons and they're just like, no answer. And so I was just like, no, you need to know what they want saying, okay, I need to interview my patrons to make sure that I am getting what they want in the library and I'm supplying stuff, not just picking things that I like and I think are going to be helpful. I, I did have a, a real a tough time was trying to get several of my peers to understand that working with like the undocumented students was not going to be easy peasy, right? You know, it wasn't going to be in, you know, the, having them understand like the aspect of why undocumented students are so put off with working with university people because of the aspect of they're seen as lab rats, you know, and they're just saying, no, we don't want just this quarter long thing. And then they disappear from our lives. Right. And, um, and so then I, I kind of became that barrier between the undocumented students and the LIS program, because a lot of them even will say, well, like, well, did you talk to Diane to see about your project idea? And, you know, and it became that way where, you know, if someone was interested in working with them, it, from my cohort, it was just like, you ha they had to talk to me first. And I was just like, I'm okay with doing that, right? Um, it was a really interesting position, but, um, you know, it, the understanding of what diversity and equity and inclusion means to not academia, but to the real world is completely different. And that was something that was like, I was just like, no, like you, you have to put yourself in the shoes of these individuals. And you have to understand what it means to, you know, have an Ill illiterate mother or having a mother that doesn't speak English. Um, and having, you know, working class parents and, you know, you, there's a lot of things that go on in these, you know, in these individuals lives that you have to consider, you know, and if you can't connect with them, then you, if you can't connect or build a relationship with that population, then you can't serve that population because that population values 
trust and relationship building and transparency because of how much they've gone through where, you know, transparency wasn't a part of their life and now they want that. No matter what degree you get, you could always sell it how you want to sell it. I have sociology and political science and yeah, I took statistics classes and then I just like did Apple and I was like, well, this is what I have and this is what I learned and this is what I could, what I bring to the table, you know, do you want it or do you not want it? That work at Bibliotech um, sounds fascinating and it made me um, want to jump to a question that we had. How do you define digital libraries and digital librarianship? No, uh, yeah, no, Bibliotech would, is probably like how I would, the object of how I would define I saw it as a place that brought resources to an area that, like I was mentioning, that was a technology desert. It brought a space for people to be able to, you know, step outside their world, um, you know, and, and have access to technology and to reliable internet and being able to do what so many of us, you know, um, forget that we have the privilege of, right? Like being able to walk around with a laptop or being able to have good access to internet. Um, and of course there was their downsides, right? Like the hours of operation, you know, a digital library is like, while we, everybody says, oh, the digital library is open 24 hours. The physical building is not. One of my closest friends, when her internet was down or when she couldn't afford to pay for her internet bill would go to the parking lot and just park really close to the building and just kind of use the internet from there. And so, you know, you saw that a lot. You did see that, you know, at, at after hours, how people would, you know, go park next to the bibliotheque and, you know, because the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi was still on, right? And so they were able to do that. But <clears throat> that risk of being in a parking lot at night, um, the aspect of heat, you know, Texas, we know how hot it is. And so I, you know, my thoughts of a digital library is yes, 24 hour service online, but it's also a place to always remember that it's not just the online services that matter, but the physical building and the resources that are within that building, right? Like, are the computers modern? Are they up to date? Are they, you know, are they providing instruction services about digital literacy skills? Um, are they also working with community organizations to provide services and things like that, make it, it like a centralized place for anybody to go and do what they need to have done. And so that's how I kind of see digital libraries. I think that they're very community-based oriented. You're going to have people in the community who are not going to care that you're a digital library and they're going to think of you more as the computer store and, and you got to be okay with that. You know, you have to be okay with that, that they're going to come in just to use the computer and nothing else. But if you start to have interactions with them and you start to build that relationship and you start to build that trust, then you could do it like my friend Isabel did, where she started a book club and she actually got kids in the neighborhood to read books. And I remember we had them read Ready Player One. Um and because she was like, I have no idea what to choose. I was like, dude, she's ready player one. Everybody play video games. Um, and so she chose that one. And it was like, it was the start of a really good program. And, um, and you know, and it brought in, it brought kids into realizing like, oh, I could do more than just hang out here and use the computers to surf the web. Like I have people who could support me in what I want to do and, you know, and she took that time to that book club and they did the read out loud. And so she was helping them with like, you know, the whole aspect of language and proficiency and literacy and comprehension. She did that in the afternoon from like four to six and um, like once a week. And so, you know, that's where I think digital libraries come into play, you know, um, and a, like a librarian, our librarian was from San Marcos and she would drive in sometimes, um, but she didn't have that huge of a role. And it was a lot of the library assistants that did a lot of more work 
but for a librarian, I think with a digital library, it's like you have to have a, a form of communication with your patrons because you're behind a screen or you're in other location because you could remote in and you have to build a way to build that trust in that relationship. So then your collection matches the need of the community. What do you love about digital libraries and what keeps you motivated to work in the fields? Um, okay, so when I started working at Bibliotech, that was 2014, right? Um, and I had just finished a seven year long job at Apple retail, right? Where I was, uh, I worked at the Genius Bar, right? And I, I got to a point where I was just like, okay, I like interacting with people, but I started realizing how much I had distanced myself from my community and how empty I felt not having that presence in my life, right? So that's how I got to the bibliotech and, you know, um, and it was a real like life changer, right? Um, and so I think one of the things that I love about my time there was having that moment to reunite with the community, work with the community, um, really like stand in solidarity with them, you know, do workshops. Um, like I think we would, I would go do workshops in like, like at community centers, right? They would just call us and be like, oh, we want, we want a presentation. Like, can you come and do a presentation? So our boss would be like, okay, you're gonna take this one, you're gonna take that one, you'll take that one, right? And you know, there was moments where the, the presentations were in English or in Spanish. And so then they gave me a chance to kind of, you know, recuperate some of the Spanish that I had lost um, as I was growing up. And so um, I, the, the one thing I, I was really glad with working at Bibliotech was that aspect of community. And I think that's the one thing like I, I like about digital libraries is that you can, you know, there is a community out there that wants a digital library and that are not a, a, unaware of digital libraries. And, you know, and I, I just like the idea that you could have this mixture of physical items and digital objects coexist in one place. Remember, you're not alone doing this. When you, when you go into doing projects that are super, close and personal and that would probably be another advice for students that I could share is that like don't step away from doing projects like that but then all, but make sure that you learn how to compartmentalize and you learn how to manage your emotions so when you're doing the research you're doing it as a researcher not as a not as an insider you're an outsider at that time and and understanding that role of what does it mean to be an insider outsider of your own community. And so, you know, learning compartmentalize your emotions, compartmentalize the information that you're given. Also understanding, give yourself a break, you know? Um, it's okay that you, you know, you don't have to do it every day. You know, you could take a week off, you could take a month off um, because the issue is still gonna be there. And that also that you're not alone when you do like social justice work, especially, right? You're not alone. You may feel like you're doing it by yourself because it is sometimes a solo job, but there's other people out there to support you and help you.